Welcome everyone uh, joining us at the Child Neurology Foundation webinar on the role of genetic testing on shortening the diagnostic odyssey. I'm Scott Palmer. I'm the president of the Child Neurology Foundation and I will be moderating today's presentation. Every year, Child Neurology Foundation Board of Directors identifies an important education initiative that impacts the entire child neurology community. So this year, we decided to uh, focus on the topic of shortening the diagnostic odyssey. And this is such an important topic, we've decided to dedicate two years uh, to this topic. So part of this initiative, we began by collecting uh, some data about the journey through the diagnosis through, uh, from uh, families and clinicians, and we'll give you a few of the findings of that um, survey. First, I'd like to thank our lead advocacy partners, Epilepsy Foundation, Global Genes, Neurabilities, as well as our believer partner, Hope for Hypothalamic Hamartomas. And we'd also like to thank our lead industry partners, Biomarin, PTC Therapeutics, and UCB, as well as believer partner, Neurogene. Without this support, Today's presentation would not be possible. The vision of the foundation is a world where all children affected by neurologic disorders reach their full potential. I was drawn to this organization because it brings together patients and their families together with physicians and other care providers to focus on and address issues important to the care of nervous system disease. We all know that the journey from presentation of symptoms to diagnosis uh, is crucial for every family. We want to increase the chances that treatments offered will be effective in reducing and eliminating disease and restore patients' quality of life. To make this journey as short as possible and as error-free as science allows, it's uh, critical that we uh, move uh, forward uh, quickly. A child who suffers without a diagnosis may be deprived not only of their childhood, but the delay of diagnosis can have long-term impact on the child's development and their growth to a happy, uh, healthy, independent adult. So we want to understand how this impacts everyone. And as I said, we conducted uh, surveys to learn more about the diagnostic journey. We had over 300 responses from the Child Neurology Society membership and uh, 30, uh, and, and we received 1,100 responses from patients uh, and families, and caregivers. We learned that families notice symptoms early in life. Over half of the patients who responded, parents who responded to our surveys noticed their child's symptoms uh, occurred in the first six months of life. And even though symptoms present early, our data further showed that the cause of these symptoms often goes undiagnosed for years. Nearly 50% uh, received uh, primary diagnosis within one year of uh, symptoms emerging. However, a quarter uh, were without a diagnosis even five years lady, later and 10% had to wait as long as 10 years. In addition, uh, mid misdiagnoses occur uh, commonly. 41% of families uh, reported at least one misdiagnosis. And of those with a misdiagnosis, nearly half were misdiagnosed more than once. Clinicians don't always order uh, whole genome or whole exome sequencing at the time of seeking a diagnosis. There are many reasons for this. Um, but over a quarter of the physicians uh, on the survey reported they never ordered uh, whole genome sequencing. And, and primarily the reason was, uh, stated reason was that insurance may not cover the cost. It's a complex problem uh, for certain uh, and one that um, presents challenges to everyone, patients, parents, and uh, providers alike. It's something that we uh, are, are all uh, working toward uh, resolving. So 
So to do the diagnostic odyssey requires uh, collaboration and connection. I mean, caregivers do their best if uh, they, they know their child symptoms and behaviors the best. It's not always easy to uh, portray these accurately to the doctors and the doctors uh, need to hear clearly what the issues are. And it's very important that we take time to listen, to empathize, to understand the concerns and also to understand uh, the symptoms and presenting uh, features that can lead to a diagnosis. We all like to take advantage of parent advocacy groups uh, and groups like the Child Neurology Foundation to provide support, but also reliable medically sound information so caregivers can uh, come to their appointments uh, prepared. In addition to uh, webinars such as this one, we have uh, as a second component of our education initiative, an educational symposium for clinicians at the annual Child Neurology Society meeting. We just had uh, a meeting uh, recently uh, within the past month. And at this uh, symposium, uh, we presented part one of the uh, Diagnostic Odyssey. Um, this was, a, as you might imagine, a virtual symposium, uh, but we were able to share, and here are the speakers uh, shown on your screen, uh, both a family perspective on hopes and fears for a diagnosis and treatment, uh, two, how child neurologists can support families through genetic testing, three, the impact of genetic uh, testing and progress uh, in uh, using genetic testing to uh, more rapidly uh, get to a diagnosis and how it can make a difference in epilepsy. And finally, uh, a model for diagnosing rare di neurologic diseases that uh, will lead to precision therapy. Feedback from participants was very positive and we're excited to dive deeper into this topic at uh, next year's annual meeting where we'll largely focus on um, the uh, consequences of the diagnosis of the uh, diagnostic odyssey. This year, we kind of described the odyssey, some of the aspects of it. Next year, uh, we will focus on uh, what are the consequences. Today for the webinar, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our primary speaker, Sanal Mahida. Sanal is a genetic counselor uh, in the Epilepsy Genetics Program at Boston Children's Hospital. She joined uh, in June, 2018. She provides counseling for families in the Epilepsy Genetic Counseling Program, as well as the Neonatal Epilepsy Clinic. Sanal received her bachelor's in biology from University of Massachusetts Amherst in 2012, her master's in genetics counseling from University of Maryland in 2014, and then worked at the Kennedy Krieger Institute in the Department of Neurogenetics for four years before coming to Boston Children's Hospital in 2018. So Sunal, uh, take it away and you can get control of the slides. Thank you. What I'm going to be going through today um, is kind of the diagnostic odyssey from um, our perspective in terms of kind of what the types of testing available are, how much does it cost, um, what the benefits are, what uh, families may see as risks and disadvantages, as well as the role of counselors, um, genetic counselors, how we can help you guys to order testing and facilitate. Um, so. To kind of start, I was going to go through um, a little bit of a genetics background 101, so to kind of frame the different types of tests that we send. Um, so as we know, we're all made up of billions and billions of cells, um, and all of these cells are chromosomes, which hold our genes and our DNA. So it's basically our DNA is packaged into, into these tight blue wound um, figures called chromosomes. And if we unwind our chromosomes, we can find our genes and our DNA, which is made up of these, you know, combination of these four letters, A, C, G, and T. So if we think of the chromosomes, um, this picture is basically in every cell in every part of our body and it directs everything. So kind of, you know, our instruction manual in terms of directing um, our hair color, eye color, you know, things that don't particularly necessarily matter up to 
how our brain forms, how the heart forms, kidneys, all of that stuff um, is directed by all of our genes on these chromosomes. And if we were to zoom in on all these chromosomes, we still have you know, tens and thousands of individual genes. So we like to think of these chromosomes as you know, the chromosome pairs as chapters in our book. And then if we think of all of our genes, you know, we have over 20,000 genes in our genome and those are kind of like the pages in our book. So the book is kind of, you know, the whole genome, all of our genes, all of our chromosomes, chapters are those chromosomes, and then the pages are like those genes. So just like we were to read, you know, pages in a book and instruction manual, all of our genes are made up of letters, which our body uses in order to make proteins, which then are kind of shuttled off to different places to do their job. So this shows, um, you know, the first strand up top, DNA strand, um, is, you know, inside of our genes are made up of all these letters, and every three letters codes for a specific building block. So to simplify, you know, the first three letters there, um, ACC, you know, might code for, will code for this here. Next three letters will code for this, will code for this. Um, and the question really lies, you know, whenever we're trying to figure out a genetic cause, is could there be a letter change, you know, somewhere here in this instruction manual, which might affect this code down here and could ultimately affect a protein that's being made. So these are examples of kind of the types of changes that we can find. So if we start out with a sentence, as the man saw the dog hit the can, um, if we can take things like what we call point mutations or point variants, um, if we change one single letter, it might change the meaning of this sentence. Same thing here, if we delete something, so we delete the word dog, that's gonna change you know, entirely the meaning of the sentence. Same thing with insertion, we can insert a word here, which might change the meaning, and a frame shift would basically mean that we kind of delete one letter there, um, and that'll change the way that we read these words. So if our body reads things in three-letter codes and you take a letter out, one three-letter code might be changed um, as you continue on to read that gene and read those instructions. So this is just kind of a brief example of the different types of changes, but there are many, many other types of changes that we can run into as well. So going along that, if we're thinking of our genes as kind of our instruction manuals, there are a lot of different types of genetic tests that can be done. So depending on a child's clinical symptoms, different providers might choose to perform different testing. So it kind of depends um, on what you know, your child's symptoms are, any testing they've had done before, um, have they had any symptoms that warrant you know, maybe not genetic testing, but maybe other labs first and then perform genetic testing, really depends on you know, each individual child. The current testing we have available, which I'll go through, um, the microarrays, we have gene panels, single gene testing, whole exome sequencing, and then whole genome sequencing. And whole genome sequencing, which I'll talk a little bit about, is still mostly on a research basis, so not really um, being done clinically quite yet. It's still more of on the research basis right now. So this is to just give kind of the scale of variation that we might look at. So if we take any chromosome in particular as an example, this might be chromosome one, and we were to zoom in on this specific section, we can look in that section for what we call copy number variations or things that are deleted or duplicated, so missing or extra information. And we could find that on some of the testing, or we could kind of dig a little bit deeper and go into the letters in that gene and try to figure out, you know, like we were looking at those examples before, is there a letter change somewhere in there? So an A to a C change, a letter missing, a sequence change such as that. So thinking along those lines, if we think of the chromosomal microarray, this looks mostly for missing or extra pieces of DNA or extra pieces of information. So it's like if we were thinking of our chapters and our pages, it's basically going through and saying, does a child have all the chapters and does he, have, he or she have all the pages? They're not looking to see if there are any letters missing or anything misspelled. It's just looking to see if there's anything missing or extra in terms of chapters and pages. Um, this is often done as a first-tier test for children with developmental delay and or autism spectrum disorders, um, but a lot of clinics, a lot of you know, things are starting to move more towards um, deeper kind of whole exome sequencing as a first line as well, but this tends to be the first line for children who have developmental delay and autism spectrum disorders to try to see if there are any missing or extra pieces there. 
We also have a lot of specific gene panels. So there's specific gene panels for all of you know, the different conditions that you can think of. So um, epilepsy panels, intellectual disability panels, autism, you know, microcephaly, movement disorders. There's a lot of panels um, for other you know, specific disorders as well. If there's immune genetics panels, things like that. So if a you know, child might have a specific set of symptoms, we might think about looking at a panel first because they look through a subset of those 20,000 genes rather than looking at all of them. And a lot of times we might be more likely to find an answer there. So they have a faster turnaround, might be a little less expensive um, depending on insurances. So we may start there as well. And then single gene testing, um, it's really only done if a child is suspected to have a specific condition. So if you think you know, they fit a very, very specific genetic condition, you might look at just one gene out of the 20,000. Um, if a child has symptoms that might fit into you know, a couple different disorders or a hundred different disorders, you know, they have broad picture, then we might go more with panels or use you know, full exome sequencing. But if we know a specific condition, this is really where we would start. And then whole exome sequencing, which is becoming more common um, now, is that it looks at all 20,000 genes. So it reads through all the important parts, basically, of all 20,000 genes at once. Um, it's typically done including both parents, because if we think of normal variation between, you know, myself and everybody else or, you know, anybody, there's normal variation between different people. So the, the hard part is really ruling out what is normal variation versus what could be a cause. And oftentimes parents can help with that um, because you know, if a child is half mom, half dad, we can kind of rule out a lot of that normal familial variation to try to find an answer. And right now we can find an answer in up to 40% of kids using whole exome sequencing. Um, that number is increasing you know, year by year as we learn more about the genes, but there is still a lot of uncertainty as well with results of whole exome sequencing. Um, and these are to kind of show in terms of what we're looking at, um, the depth of what we look at. So genome sequencing, which is still research basis, um, would look at all the parts of our DNA. So our DNA has kind of these green parts called exons, plus these white parts called introns. And, you know, these introns used to be called kind of junk DNA in terms of we didn't really know what it did. We thought it didn't do anything important. Um, now we know that there might be some roles for, for the DNA here to kind of help things over here to be turned on or turned off. But we really don't know what changes in these white regions mean yet. So we really look here in these regions that will code for proteins. But overall, it only makes up, you know, the exome, which are these green parts, only make up about 1% of our DNA. So we still have a lot to learn, um, which is why, you know, we can't find an answer in 100% of our kiddos yet. And then whole genome sequencing, like we said, we'll go through all of the parts of the 20,000 genes, not only those kind of important parts of the parts that make proteins. Um, this would also require both parents. Um, and it is clinically available, but it's very hard to interpret and tends to be very expensive through insurance. So typically done on a research basis right now. Um, and this is kind of, again, another depiction kind of just showing um, the breadth of what we look at. So whole genome versus an exome, and then a gene panel would be just a little piece of this. So we have different levels that we can look at um, depending on a child's symptoms. Okay. Um, so the possible results from testing, positive, negative, uncertain. I'm not gonna get too much in detail about what each of these means because I mention it only because the uncertainty will come into play a little bit later, but it, you know, in general, positive would mean we found a diagnosis, it's definitive. Um, negative would mean we didn't find anything but normal variation. And then uncertain, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, would mean that we, you know, found something we're not really positive whether it's the answer or not. So one question that we get, um, you know, most often, so when we're talking about testing with our families, you know, how much is this test going to cost me? Um, so there's a lot of different ways that it can be billed. So I'll briefly go through the different ways that testing can be billed um, that families can kind of navigate and providers will be able to help you guys navigate. So if we start up top, you know, there's always insurance billing. Um, so many of the labs actually have policies that you contract with certain insurance companies and will give you, you know, certain benefits. Um, many labs are in network with every insurance or most insurances. And so that way they're able to bill in network um, and only charge, you know, deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance. And in that way, um, many of the labs are able to, for example, you know, they can do what they call a benefits investigation, look into your insurance for you, 
come back with an out-of-pocket cost and then discuss your options with you. So that's, you know, things that some of the labs have services for. They have a billing department who might be able to do that. Um, some labs will be contracted with, you know, only state insurances um, in the state that they're in. Some will be contracted with only certain states. So it really depends. Uh, but many labs do have really good policies in terms of, you know, if you send them testing, they're able to discount prices um, or they're able to, you know, get a good price based on being in network with all insurances. Um, and then many institutes, so this is a confusing factor for many families. Um, so institutes often have contracts with certain labs and they bill um, insurance, you know, in a different way, which is called institutional billing. So usually what happens is your provider has to submit a letter of medical necessity to insurance. Um, they get approval or denial. And then based on that, they're able to give you an out-of-pocket cost. This is typically um, when a you know institute is only contracted to a certain lab, so you're not able to send to any lab that you want based on their insurance policies, but it's more we have to send to XYZ lab. Um, this sometimes poses a barrier because a lot of the labs um, with if you direct insurance bill will kind of give you that benefit of being in network with all insurances, whereas institutional it looks as if the institute is billing, um, so it works a little bit differently and families might have to do a little bit more legwork to try to figure out kind of what their cost is in that in that sense. There's always self-pay. Um, so many labs will give what they call a compassionate care price for patients who don't have insurance or if it's um, not covered at all. And those are often discounted up to like 30 or 40 percent of what they would charge normally. Um, still pretty hefty for a lot of the tests, but there's always a self-pay option. And then there's sponsored testing. Um, so many labs are, you know, sponsoring testing for certain disorders. Um, for example, there's, you know, an epilepsy panel through certain labs um, that they will sponsor for patients if they meet a certain criteria. And you know, providers will go on and fill out an eligibility form. And if you're eligible, they do the testing free of charge. So there's always those options. Um, so things like that that can be found by providers or you know families even you know to go online and try to find sponsored testing if there are no other options. And then I put other in here because some institutes might have other kind of roundabout ways to to go about billing or they might have other policies. Um, this is kind of the typical four routes of being able to pay for testing. Um, so with insurance billing, what we look at is kind of which lab has the best policy. Um, is our you know, hospital contracted with a certain lab? Is the lab in network? And then we'll look at deductibles, co-pays, co-insurances, and then financial assistance through the labs. And then institutional bill, this is just kind of showing you guys what the process is. So hospital contracted lab, we ask for pre-auth, and then if authorized, they determine the out-of-pocket cost. If denied, we can try other methods self-pay we went through, and then the sponsored testing, um, same. So many labs have no cost testing that's available. So bottom line for families is don't always assume that the test is too expensive. Um, you know, making sure to ask about all the different options that are available because many times providers can figure out a way to get the testing done. Um, so, you know, if one place tells you the test is $10,000 out of pocket or $5,000 out of pocket, um, you know, not to give up. There are definitely options that are available um, through different labs and through different institutes as well. Right. Um, so aside from that, um, in terms of the diagnostic odyssey, you know, many times when I meet with families, they'll ask me, you know, what is the point of doing this test? Is this going to help my child? Um, are we going to get, you know, medication from this? Are we going to get a treatment? And how will this testing help my family as a whole? So this is a quote from one of our um, patients who had testing done. Um, so, you know, the mom said, you know, because there's not a main form of diagnosis, what we have is a gene sequence to point to. It has been, hasn't been very helpful, for example, getting resources from certain governmental entities. So this is a patient who might not have found that, you know, the, it was helpful in getting resources, um, but, you know, felt that there is a gene sequence that she can point to. So in terms of changes in management, um, we can see changes in medication, um, but a lot of times that's for more, you know, things like epilepsy, where we can see certain genetic uh, causes of epilepsy. We know certain medications work better, for example, or known conditions. Um, you know, example is like fragile X syndrome is a very, very well-known condition. And if we think about um, kids with ADHD who have fragile X syndrome, they've actually found that some medications work better than other medications just because of the biology of it. 
So that's something you know that we could find as a change in a medication if they're being managed for something. Um, we also kind of look at screening for other conditions. So if we find an answer, you know, when kids are or when they were born, you know, were defects found, were kidney defects found? Are there any other organ systems involved that we might want to look at? Um, if the child is young, um, you know, still in their first 10 years, when children are adults, when they become adults, are there any adults with the same condition? And what have they faced, you know, as they get older? Anything else that we should be looking out for? What else can we screen them for? So rather than kind of immediate treatments, these are more along the lines of what we find. Um, with most genetic disorders, immediate treatments right now um, are not, not likely in terms of having a medication that might cure or solve a symptom completely, but change management do happen all the time with epilepsy specifically or with, you know, very, very well-known syndromes that have certain symptoms as, um, you know, certain symptoms that are associated that might be changes in medication for like ADHD or, you know, other, other concerns that they have. The other thing we get out um, of the testing is recurrence risk information. So if a family is thinking about having additional children and we find an answer, we'll be able to kind of tell them, you know, a definitive risk what is this, that another child would have the same condition. Um, are the child's siblings at risk? Are the parents' siblings at risk? Do they need to be worried about nieces and nephews? Also for the child themselves, um, when and if they want to go on to have their own children, what is their risk and how can they kind of, you know, mitigate that? Um, are they able to do any testing? And then the extended family, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins as well. So we can often answer this question, um, especially if families are thinking of having more kids, this becomes more important to try to figure out and let them know what their options are at that point. And then prognosis. So like we said, you know, are there other children with the same genetic disorder, what can we learn from them? Um, you know, if a child has seizures, will seizures get worse, better? Is there, you know, any evidence that most children grow out of their seizures by a certain age? Um, is there any evidence that, you know, they don't grow out of seizures and they might need medication long-term? Is there anything that might limit life expectancy or should we expect other health issues to come up? So a lot of information about prognosis can be found. Um, I want to caution this with saying, you know, the rare disorders, we might not be able to give this much information, but if we're, you know, confined at least a couple other children or even 10 children who have the same, you know, genetic disorder, we can often give you at least a little bit of information. And then access to services. So um, oftentimes genetic diagnoses can help patients gain access to services. So um, government-based services, so Medicaid, and then therapies. So a lot of, um, you know, children will be at You'd be eligible for additional services. So ABA, speech, occupational, their school, you know, education plan might change based on what we find if they're at risk for something else. Or we find out, you know, many children with this specific genetic disorder have been shown to learn one way or the other. And then kind of one of the most important things is psychosocial and other support. So how can we help you connect with other families, get involved in foundations, um, you know, self-care, being able to connect with other parents, being able to connect with other children. Um, and then a lot of our families have told us that finding an answer provides closure. Um, and for a lot of moms and dads, alleviation of guilt and blame. So many parents um, will say, you know, was there this one incident that did this, you know, cause the autism spectrum disorder to happen? Or did this cause my child's epilepsy to happen? You know, they fell off the bed or this happened or that happened when they were younger. But if we know that there is a defined genetic cause, you know, we can tell you that it definitely wasn't that kind of single event that happened that would have caused their symptoms. There really was something there kind of from the beginning that was a genetic change. All right, so along with kind of looking at um, how the testing would help individuals, we can also look at, you know, patients will ask us all the time, you know, will, are there any risks to the testing? Are there any barriers? Um, will it harm my child or family in any way? So for this, um, I'm going through more of kind of perceived risks and barriers of testing because in general, genetic testing doesn't have a solid, you know, risk to a child because it involves a blood draw or a cheek swab. Um, so other than the blood draw, the cheek swab, you know, um, them fighting the blood draw or fighting the cheek swab being done, there's no real physical harm that can be done to a child with it, but more along the lines of barriers to testing or parents' perceived risk of testing. So no real risks, um, more perceived risks. 
The biggest barrier is the cost. Um, so some insurance companies will not approve genetic testing and they will not pay for it. So they might be out of network with labs, might have high deductible plans. Um, so this tends to be our, our biggest barrier is saying, even if we go through the best process that we have available, um, we're still not able to do the testing because the out of pocket actually ended up being too high for our family. And this is when we might turn to looking for sponsored testing or seeing if there's a discounted price, but oftentimes it also just kind of you know, per pervades and that we can't find a lower cost for a family. Um, so this is kind of showing you, you know, the main reasons why people might not be able to get testing. So geographical barrier, um, there might not be access to clinics or, you know, individuals who are comfortable ordering the testing. Genetic testing can be really complex. Um, so if we're thinking about, you know, providers who might not be, feel comfortable ordering or interpreting the results of testing and families aren't able to find somewhere that's within, you know, a distance that they're able to go um, to be able to see a provider. Individuals don't meet criteria. So insurance has criteria um, as well as some, you know, centers, some institutes will have strict criteria in who they order genetic testing for. Prohibitive costs, um, patients fail to be referred. So many providers, pediatricians, um, you know, won't refer a patient to a facility or a clinic that they can get genetic testing in. Um, or the genetic testing is offered too late, so kind of along the same grounds. And then limited access to genetic counselors. So, um, you know, we kind of serve as liaisons between medical providers and the genetic testing. Um, so if you are not able to see a genetic counselor, oftentimes the testing can be limited. Um, so this is one thing that we've heard from families. So this is anecdotal, but many families feel like if we do the genetic testing, we're going to know that there's a change in a gene there and we're not able to change that, you know, that gene change is not going to go away. So we feel like we're putting our child in a box. If we figure out that there is a genetic disorder, then we think, you know, we might think they won't improve in their skills or they won't get over, um, you know, they won't grow out of their seizures or they won't get over their challenges that they're having now. But, you know, we make sure um, when we're seeing families that we, you know, there's no box that we can ever put a child in based on symptoms that are found. So every syndrome will have a list of symptoms. Not every child will fit into those symptoms. So they still have, you know, one gene has changed, but we still have 19,999 other genes that are working. And we never want that genetic diagnosis to limit your child. It's more of providing you information on what else could, you know, come up or how can we help them reach their full potential. Um, the psychosocial risk is a big thing that we hear from families, so dealing with uncertainty, um, which brings us back to kind of the possible results of the testing. So there are these uh, changes called variants of uncertain significance that can be found more often than not on this testing. So oftentimes we tell a family we found a change, we're really not sure what it means, and we just kind of have to follow the research for the next couple of years or, you know, 10 years um, to figure out, you know, is this really the cause for your child or not? And a lot of times families feel like that increases a lot of anxiety. Um, and you know, the only op often the only option to figure it out is research. And many families um, don't really wanna be involved in the research that they're doing to try to figure these things out. Some families are definitely okay with the research, um, but it is a lot of uncertainty to deal with. And then if we get negative results, a lot of families may feel like they're, you know, they've lost hope in a sense, we've done all the tests that we can do and we've hit a roadblock. But the important thing to remember is really that, you know, genetics changes on a daily basis. So there's never really an end of the road with genetics. We can always kind of reanalyze all the stuff that we've already done for a child. And, you know, in a year, in two years, we might be able to find an answer. But, you know, the reality of where we're at now is that our technology really surpasses our knowledge. So we're trying to catch up as best as we can. And then lastly, just kind of going through what role um, we as genetic counselors play. So how can we help you um, as families navigate the diagnostic odyssey and kind of have better access to all of the tests that are available and also have better access to kind of explanation of results and follow up things like that. Um, so this is from one of our families. Um, so, you know, this mother said, I think one thing that has been helpful to us is that the genetic counselor we worked with was very accessible. Because a lot of time when you sit in that initial appointment, they say, do you understand? Do you have any questions? And your head is spinning and you say, I understand, I don't have any questions. Then you go home and your spouse says to you, what about this? And you go, oh, I didn't really think about that. So having that person to be on call is very helpful. 
Um, so we do like to make ourselves very available to our patients. So that's something that we always hope that we're more, you know, we're very available to you anytime that you have questions via email or phone call. We tend to um, kind of have a fast turnaround time in our departments uh, as to calling patients back. So this is going through um, kind of what all the different aspects that genetic counseling can provide. So some of these things we've talked about in terms of, you know, mode, of, mode and risk of inheritance. Um, what is the age of onset? education and support for families, um, results, potential results, implications of the testing. So we talk a lot more um, about other things also, not just related to the testing, but then will your employment and insurance be affected if you have one of these conditions that might be considered pre-existing, things like that. Communicating with other family members. Um, oftentimes we can facilitate communicating things with extended family if there's something inherited. And then psychological aspects. So kind of providing that psychosocial care as well as the educational piece. And this is just another quote. So, um, you know, the genetic counselor is able to lay out the process step by step, break down the information. Um, no provider had ever explained anything in that way before. So this is kind of our role is really to break it down for you guys to be able to um, tell you the information and pieces that are small and digestible and are able to be easily understandable by, you know, families and other clinicians alike. So, you know, we're often the connection between the doctor and the patient. So we think of ourselves, you know, as medical liaisons, educators, and more. So we can provide um, increased access to testing, but also help navigate that odyssey in terms of figuring out what the cost is, helping you navigate different, you know, insurances, um, help you navigate your options. And the main thing that, you know, we we do like to um, kind of pride ourselves on is having an informed decision-making process. So it's part of our philosophy of genetic counseling is to make sure that you guys have all the information that you need in order to actually make a decision for your child. Do you want, you know, do you want to do the testing for them or do you not? Um, that's really, you know, what we would like to provide for you guys as well as that informed decision-making process as well. So this is um, a link where you guys, you know, anybody can go onto this site and find a genetic counselor near them. Um, you can specify, you know, based on your region and then based on what you're trying to look for. So pediatric genetic counselor, neurogenetics counselor, cancer genetic counselor, you can kind of filter it. Um, and now in our more remote world, these telehealth companies are um, very useful. So Gray Genetics, FDNA, um, these are companies that provide telehealth genetic counseling and don't require referrals from doctors often, but they do work with um, MDs within their networks as well to make sure that we're kind of giving you guys appropriate information. Um, most of them are self-pay fixed fee um, for initial and follow-up appointments, but there they are options for some families who are not able to find a provider in their area who can refer them to a genetic counselor. All right, and that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Sunal. So uh, we now have some time for questions, but before we begin uh, with questions, I'd like to point you to the Child Neurology Foundation website uh, for more, there's more information, especially there's a um, information sheet considering genetic testing shown here on the slide that gives an outline of uh, some of the issues that were raised today, benefits of genetic testing, types of tests, what the role is of the genetic counselor and cost. So I encourage you to go on the web uh, page, it's shown down at the bottom, and uh, you can download this uh, PDF file for your uh, interest and, and uh, feel free to distribute that to any of your friends as well. So to uh, ask questions, just go on either the chat or uh, question and answer section. We will look at them and um, try to answer the questions. First question uh, from Mary, uh, do all genetic testing labs contact the patient when a variant of unsignif uncertain significance has been identified as having significance? Uh, my own personal experience is that it's the answer is no, but Sanal may have uh, other experiences. I, typically what happens is an, an assessment of, of the, uh, say you do a, an exome is done at the time that it's ordered and a readout will be done. And to get a second look at it, you have to go back and request uh, for that to, to be done at a, at a future date. And, and uh, 
if you're in a situation where you've had exome sequencing and, and no answer or certain uh, variants of unknown significance are, occurred, it's, it's probably a good idea to go back and try again uh, sometime in the future. So now, any other thoughts? Yeah, so um, the labs don't necessarily reach out to patients um, to tell you if a you know a, a change has changed from like a VUS to pathogenic. Um, they do sometimes reach out to the clinician, so they'll automatically send updated reports in some labs um, to say that you know this has changed from uncertain to positive or pathogenic. Um, but that's becoming less of the practice now. Um, but like Dr. Pomeroy said, we typically do have to reach out to them and, you know, ask for a reclassification um, if we want it. Um, there are some labs that will reach out to the clinician, but a lot of times we, most of the time, we'll have to ask them to do that. Okay. Uh, another question is, uh, is there a place uh, that I can go to get information about uh, how to get genetic testing covered if insurance does not typically um, you would go through your own physician or resources uh, of your physician's institution to find uh, this information um, not sure of a national resource and all do you know of anything yeah i don't think there there isn't there really isn't a national resource for it unfortunately um it's more going through the clinicians or going through your insurance and trying to figure it out be persistent that's all <laughs> yeah exactly. don't, don't give up i mean i can tell you uh we spend an enormous amount of time and resources um on the issue of pre-authorizations and finding um you know, the, the right funding. And of course, we don't want to put anyone uh, at risk, especially if the cost is high. If you, if you do um, both child and parents whole exome, it, it can add up and, and be a significant amount of money. So uh, just be persistent and, and uh, we would uh, certainly try to help we, the collective we, uh, physicians, providers, genetics counselors, try to help you uh, get to a better place. Do we see an increase of referrals for genetic testing for behavior-based diagnosis such as autism due to limited in-person assessment? Um, I think that typically uh, it, it's really pretty variable, and you know, part of the challenge um, with genetic testing is it, it, it's not exactly the right thing to do for every person. You, you have to have the right scenario and the right set of tests. So for autistic spectrum disorder, as uh, Sinal said, you, you may just start with uh, the microarray approach and, and begin with that. that there, are very, um, there are a few syndromes that are pretty clear as, uh, as clearly associated with single genes that have autism as a component of those syndromes but the vast majority of patients don't have that. So uh, it, with for autism. Uh, do some labs have less variants of uncertain significance than others? Um, I'm, I'm sure it varies to some extent from lab to lab. It's a very um, fluid field. I mean, new discoveries are made every day. And that's why it's always good to go back and check again. Um, so the labs also have like they have they're called they are put out by the American College of Medical Genetics their guidelines for interpreting variants. Um, so most labs in the United States are required to follow the standard guidelines for interpreting variants. So now um, we hope that you know variant of uncertain significance is across the board a variant of uncertain significance. But previously labs used to use their own kind of standards, um, and so. Any reports before, you know, 2015, 2016, they can vary a lot um, in terms of what a lab classifies something as. But where they're trying to now create a standardized um, interpretation system, so most labs should have the same, theoretically should have the same uh, classification for each variant. But it still might vary a little bit. Um, with older reports, it'll definitely vary. Is uh, Down syndrome? considered a neurological disability, um, not per se. I mean, Down syndrome um, is a genetic disorder as, as 
probably you know, it's trisomy 21. Uh, and, and there's a very variable expression of um, phenotype. Uh, some, some are more effective than others. Uh, intellectual disability can occur uh, in Down syndrome um, and other uh, characteristic features, but it's, it's highly variable. Okay. Is there such a thing as a false positive or a false negative? Do labs push those rates? If I choose to self-pay, be interested in knowing those differences. Um, hopefully that doesn't uh, vary so much from lab to lab as and all said. Um, the, uh, there's standards of interpretation that apply across labs and, and uh, in, in, inherently, there may be false positives and negatives, but um, the, uh, the standards should, should apply across all labs. Other questions? Again, I, 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 while you, people are thinking, um, I'll, I'll emphasize that not every syndrome has a genetic basis. And so, you know, we begin with symptoms that we're trying to sort out as clinicians, trying to understand. Very often there is a genetic component, but not always. And so part of the challenge is, you know, where, which direction should we go in the testing? And, um, so getting a genetic test is not always the right thing to do at the beginning, but and for those syndromes, those conditions where they're very much is uh, likely a genetic diagnosis, uh, going down the, the path of uh, testing, doing a, a, a very informed uh, set of genetic tests, uh, be it uh, a very focused test, if you have a pretty good idea of what the diagnosis is, like uh, with tuberous sclerosis or neurofibromatosis, for instance, you have good clues at the beginning to know what they are. So a limited number of testing is test, uh, testing of genes is fine. To a more broad range of testing, if, uh, if, if it's pretty clear it's di a genetic diagnosis, but we don't really know what the answer is. Any more questions? I don't see anything else popping up. Sonal, do you have other things you would want to let everyone know? No, I don't think so. Um, just that, you know, not to give up if, if you feel like testing is not an option. It usually, um, hopefully it would be an option if you kind of keep persevering through. Unfortunately, right now, sometimes it has to be the family that does a little bit of the legwork, um, but hopefully that changes in the future. Um, but also encourage you to find clinics with genetic counselors who might make it a little bit easier because that's kind of what we're here for is to kind of help you guys through that, through the Odyssey and to help um, navigate insurance information. And finally, it, it, it is a very fluid situation. Uh, every year it changes. Um, and I, I do uh, uh, agree with Sinal that a genetics counselor is uh, a critical uh, person to get involved uh, in, in this odyssey. Is it common to have a long wait to see a genetic counselor? Sinal. Yeah, so that depends on, on the the institute so for example uh, at boston children's if you're you want to see a genetic counselor plus one of our um, mds which many of the patients you know that's the appropriate referral is to see md gc team um it can be a long a pretty long wait um for example right now like our team would be booking out into you know middle of next year um at, at a minimum if not longer than that for that combination um, but if a lot of places genetic counselors can see patients on their own um, for referrals for testing and things like that, um, that tends to be less of a wait, but at you know, busier institutes, it can definitely be um, a longer wait. So I would say 
minimum of, of, you know, a month, maximum of up to six months sometimes. So it's a pretty big range depending on what type of an institute you're in. Okay. Well, I think uh, we have reached the end of the questions and thank you all for uh, listening in, participating in this uh, webinar. And uh, again, feel free to uh, go onto the website of the Child Neurology Foundation uh, to get more information. And with that, we will close uh, for the day. Thank you for listening.